You're listening to the Situation Today podcast with Golf Business. If you'd like to learn more about the latest business stories in the GCC region, please visit www.golfbusiness.com. The World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report has just been released and it paints a worrying picture of growing anxiety over the current risk matrix in our world right now. With me on the call is Renee McGowan, who is the CEO of Marsh McLennan for India, the Middle East and Africa. Renee, thank you very much for joining us on the call today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Gareth. So this report has just come out and Marsh has been pretty instrumental in helping to put it together. Uh, First of all, in a nutshell, can you explain to our audience about what the Global Risks Reports looks at exactly? Sure. So the Global Risks Report has been running um, over 20 years now and it looks at um, taking stock of what are the global risks that are impacting countries, governments, institutions, organisations, and of course, uh, individuals. Um, It's a very sophisticated report. It takes in this time the view of 1,500 experts um, around the world. Um, And we uh, take their their outlook regarding specific risks um, in both the the relative near term as well as the long term. So um, this 2024 Global Risk Report has, as as I said, 1,500 uh, global experts um, and respondents that input to it. And it really looks at risks over the next two years and then risks over the next 10 years as well um, and looks at how they compare um, in terms of what's occupying people's minds right now and what should we also be making sure that we're planning for um, as as the future comes upon us really fast. And can you tell us a bit more about the the respondents or the makeup of those respondents? Um, I can. I mean, there's 1,500 respondents um, from all, as I said, government, institutions and organisations. In an organisation and company level, it looks at senior executive response. Um, And then the the list of participants in there, there's a a long um, appendix in the report really showing the participation at the government and institutional level in um, many, many countries around the world that really give this the robustness as well. And so the the report chiefly focuses on five risk factors. Can you dive into those a bit for us um, and particularly tell us the difference between the two-year outlook and the and the 10-year outlook? Yeah, so it really looks at four categories of risks and then the fifth dimension, if you like, is that two-year and 10-year. And so the categories of risk that it looks at are climate change as number one, the second is demographic demographic bifurcation. The third there is around technological acceleration. And the fourth is geostrategic shifts. So there are four large categories. And then, as I said, there's a two-year outlook and a, a 10-year outlook. But under each of the, the categories are a myriad um, of, of questions and, and discussion points, if you like, that really delve into the details in those those categories. So, you know, in climate change, it's not just asking generalised questions. It really gets into looking at extreme weather, current impact, future impact. It looks at everything from, you know, biodiversity. Um, All of these trends are covered in there as well. And, you know, what's particularly interesting is that misinformation and disinformation are one of the top risks in the short term, but... Over the long term, it's it's more environmental concerns, right? Yeah, this was a there was some really interesting findings that have just come out in in this report, different to, to last year's as well. Um, the first one I'll, I'll cover on on climate, um, climate and the impact of climate has um, in prior reports been a longer term perspective, so it's sat in that that ten year category. Um, it's featured heavily there, particularly over recent years, but it's been at a, a further one. This year, for the first time, it moves into that two-year category. Um, And, of course, that means um, that 
well, it's reflective of the fact that people are feeling it now. I mean, the impact of adverse weather is real. Um, you know, we've had the hottest summer in the Northern Hemisphere on record. So people are feeling these impacts uh, right now in, in lives. Governments are aware of them. And there's also an increasing realisation that local communities and even countries won't necessarily be able to mitigate uh, these, you know, adverse weather impacts as well. So, um, you know, that's been the, the climate one that's been quite a, I don't want to say it's a positive shift, but at least, um, you know, being identified as a current risk means that there's an urgency on the actions that will come about. And then the second really important one, as you said, is around the misinformation and disinformation. And this has been a surprising but really important leapfrog into the top five risks for this year. And it's really about AI-generated misinformation and disinformation. And, of course, this didn't even exist last year because ChatGPT barely existed uh, at this time last year, um, but is now featuring in there at, at the number two risk. Um, and this highlights what is really the interdependencies of these risks as well, in that AI-generated misinformation and disinformation becomes increasingly important in countries and parts of the world where we have increased social and political polarisation. You couple that with the fact that we've got the social and political polarisation and we've got a third of the world's um, a third of the world's population going into uh, elections in 2024. And you can see this cycle there where we could see um, enormous volumes of information um, and a lot of it may not be grounded in fact. And also there's a sort of divergence of opinion between younger people and older people in terms of where, you know, these particular risks lie. So, so younger people seem to think that or, or feel that environmental risks in particular are more urgent, um, whereas older older respondents felt that environmental risks were something that they were there, but, but more in the distance. Can you yeah. unpack that for us as well? Yeah, sure. So 66% of respondents uh, in the survey actually believed extreme, actually placed extreme weather as a top risk. Um, but as you said, the differences were quite acute between uh, younger demographics and older. They were particular, um, extreme weather is particularly urgent for younger demographics um, and seen as a little bit more future uh, orientated or less urgent uh, for some older demographics. Now, this obviously um, reflects a whole pile of um, cultural differences between demographies um, and, and also reflects the fact that there is a healthy bias for action amongst younger generations as well. So um, there may be a frustration with um, what has been the pace of change addressing climate change over uh, prior years um, and an urgency for action. There was one other different um, bifurcation in there as well in that um, it was actually more urgent, extreme weather was seen as more urgent in the public sector in organisations than it was in the private sector, which was a little bit of a surprise um, in that we certainly know that there's many private organisations that are heavily involved in, in managing um, both extreme weather and, and climate change. But um, some interesting nuances in there that um, are important for, for governments and countries to take stock of, but also probably a reflection point for private organisations to be reflecting on, are they really up to date or are they really taking action for risks that may not be as far in the future as they think they are. And so obviously this, this report will be further discussed in the snowy Alps of Davos uh, when that particular gathering happens. But what relevance does it have for the GCC countries in the Middle East, more broadly speaking? Hugely re relevant for, for every country around the world um, and very much so for the GCC as well. It was interesting to look, of course, there is country information uh, in the report as well as the global risks. If we look at the, the Middle East, um, the big countries such as the UAE uh, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia had some similar risks aligned with, you know, the broad global risks. 
But then as we got to uh, different countries such as Qatar and Oman, we started to see more reflection of local risks uh, emerge there as well. So it is really important that the countries actually have a look and, and sort of identify and stick, make sure that they're relating and also addressing the risks that were identified there. Um, I think it was also very interesting to look at um, some of the differences that were in sort of the, the Middle East responses, in particular the UAE and, and, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, than the other countries. Um, so, for example, um, still quite high was economic downturn, inflation and everything. Um, and what wasn't high was, of course, things like um, social and political um, unrest or polarisation, social polarisation. Um, and I think this is reflecting a few things that I, I took away for, with regards to the Middle East. Um, the first is, and of course I live in the, in, in the UAE, so we experience it firsthand, um, the national agendas that are in place in many countries in the Middle East are really impactful uh, and really impactful with regards to all of these key risks that are identified, such as climate change, um, such as um, those that are fueling economic growth, you know, avoiding cost of living and inflation and these types of things. So you've got these really strong national agendas. You've then got significant investment in what are some of the, the most significant risks. And again, I take climate change there as well. We just had COP28 in the UAE at the end of last year. We really got to see the significant inroads that is happening in the Middle East to um, accelerate climate transition, to ensure just transition, and the sheer amount of investment that's going in there. This sort of continues this cycle, if you like, that um, with all of that sort of in investment and that direction that is there, um, positive direction from, from um, governments in the Middle East. We also see more social cohesion and we saw, see more economic growth and opportunity. And it's kind of like a positive flywheel, if you like, that is meaning that things like um, the social impact and polarisation, things like the alarming impact that disinformation could have, are probably reduced uh, a bit in the Middle East. And then also things like climate change uh, and the investment that is happening, we will likely see that, you know, parts of the Middle East will um, lead the way for, for other regions in the world with regards to perhaps breakthrough technologies, expertise around climate transition, um, and will be delivering it in our markets, but then perhaps exporting it to other parts of the world as well. So maybe there's something that that the rest of the world can can learn from the Middle East, from from this region going forward. Then, yeah, I think we'll um I think we we could really well see that come to to light in 2024. I think um, the rest of the world is certainly watching the the Middle East, where um everybody can see and and you know palpably feel if you're you're in the UAE or KSA or Qatar, any of these markets, you can feel that energy that is it, it's with the economic growth that is driven driven by national agendas. Um, and then if you take what I said earlier in terms of you know a third of the world's population going into electing new political leadership, um, and you know a lot of that being highly uncertain, we could be uh, in the Middle East um, a very you know, pleasing example, if you like, of the ability to focus on national agendas and positive progress. And so, just as a last question, the the report concludes by saying that that there there is some hope in so far as you know, if countries can start to collaborate um, a lot better, for example, that um, you know we can start to to mitigate these risks. Um, where do you see the, the 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 hopeful picture in all of this? Yeah, um, you know, whenever you're looking at reports like these, it can be a little bit overwhelming when you look at all the risks. And in this case, you look at all the independence of in, independency of, of risk, interdependency that's there. Um, there's a few things that that um, countries and governments in particular can be doing, but also um, I'll, I'll reference organisations and, and companies. Um, the first is that it is really important uh, that we continue driving localised strategies that will continue to target economic development and things like climate transition. Um, that is, those kind of localised strategies will be necessary in many countries around the world and really will require deliberate planning that is aligned with local conditions. Um, the second is that, um, you know, pushing for breakthrough endeavours um, 
Many countries will be doing this. I think the Middle East perhaps has an opportunity to be at the forefront of it. Um, and breakthrough endeavours will be things like technology, um, new innovation that will be impacting the likes of, of climate change, um, and then which turn impacts cost of living and, and these types of things. And then the third area is, is as you said, Gareth, is around um, collaboration and cooperation. Um, the world needs more collaboration and cooperation, particularly around these macro risks that no, no one country can solve uh, on their own. And so we have to continue to see um, mechanisms that we can have open dialogues, that we can have tangible um, cooperation and, and collaboration there between countries to solve some of these large challenges and to make sure that there's a good governance environment um, for, for us to, to be able to operate as well. And then my last point, I guess, is that segues a little bit to what private organisations should also be doing. You know, one, taking stock of, of the global risks that are there, but how they're impacting on the organisation. Um, are they actually future risks over the next 10 years or are they now um, and very imminent risks and are the right mitigations in place? But then also, what are the opportunities for collaboration amongst organisations, but also with the public sector, where we can combined be focused on, you know, what is in the public interest rather than just commercial or political interest alone? Renee McGowan, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Gareth. You're listening to the Situation Today podcast with Gulf Business. If you'd like to learn more about the latest business stories in the GCC region, please visit www.golfbusiness.com.